Well, once again, we welcome you to worship at John's Creek United Methodist Church, remote worship. We're so glad that you've joined us on this day, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening. Perhaps you're with loved ones and uh, family, and so again, we thank you for being a part of this special time together. I would like to say before I go into my uh, prayer, uh, well, I want to thank you so much for your faithful giving during this time. Uh, It's been a a strange time to say the very least, and we haven't been able to be together and worship in person, but so many of you have remained faithful in your giving, understanding we still have bills to pay and a staff to support and ministries to do, and so thank you. So I would underscore the importance of that once again as we head into the summer months. Uh, Please don't uh, stop your giving. Uh, Please remain faithful because the church continues its work and we do need your support, so thank you so much. Now let's be in an attitude of prayer together. Lord, we do thank you for this time of worship as your church gathers in different places and through different devices. We know that your spirit makes us one together as your people. And now, Lord, you've given me the amazing privilege and responsibility of preaching your word to these, my friends, and your servants. Lord, it's a task that I cannot do on my own strength, so I humbly ask for you to give me the strength and power to do it. So, Lord, speak to me and through me in such a way now that all of us receive a word from you that will make a difference to our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I need to tell you something. A few years back, I almost lost my life on a golf course, but it was Jesus who saved me truthfully. You see, this was a few years back. I was serving a church in Florida, and I played golf a lot with some of my members, as I do here at Johns Creek. And we were having a good time playing around. I was playing fairly well, and we got to a particular hole, and I thought the group ahead of us was far enough away that I could go ahead and hit. Maybe my depth perception was off, I don't know. But I teed up my ball, got my shiny driver, and I bombed the drive. I mean, I hit it long. Now, perhaps the wind was in my favor, favor, but I hit it so long that it bounced into the group ahead of us. A major golf no-no. Well, I watched in horror as a golfer in front of me picked up my ball from the fairway, got into his card and proceeded to come back in my direction. And I'm thinking, oh great, in tomorrow's paper, all over the internet, it's gonna say, pastor gets in fist fight on the golf course. My career is over. So I began to rehearse my apology speech. Oh my gosh, I'm just so sorry, this was terrible. I didn't mean to do it. And I'm watching as this cart's getting closer and closer and closer and closer to me. I mean, I am freaking out and I'm realizing the guy's not stopping and he's headed right for me. He gets closer and closer and I see as he gets closer and closer, there's fire in his eyes and he screeches to a halt and I had to get out of the way. And he walks right in front of me, there's fire in his eyes, he puts my ball in my hand and then goes, oh, you're my pastor. Pastor Charlie, it is so, it's so great to see you. And I said, listen, I'm so sorry. He said, no, no, that was, a, that was a great drive, and we'll see you later. And he drove off. And I learned something valuable that day. It pays to work for Jesus. That's right. It pays to work for Jesus. Now, why do I tell you that story? It's a true story, by the way. I can give you the names and numbers of the people who are in my foursome that day who can tell you it is true. Now, I don't think I ever saw that guy again in worship, I'm not sure, but it's a true story. And why do I tell it to you? Well, honestly, very simply, I want you to laugh. I want you to have joy, because honestly, right now, I think we are so weighted down with serious issues, this pandemic, things that people are debating about on Facebook. It is a heavy time. And I think too many people are taking themselves way too seriously. Now, don't misunderstand. I think these issues are serious. But we should never take ourselves too seriously. So this week, as I thought about this message and what I felt the Spirit was leading me to do, I truly felt I needed to bring a message that would help you get your joy back. And for your joy to be full, 
Let's not lose our joy. Oh, let's not lose our joy. Because one of the things that, that I've heard over the years, a great quote, is this. The sound of heaven is not singing, but it's laughter. Let's remember that. In fact, that quote reminds me of a great story about C.S. Lewis, the great Christian thinker. And a group of theologians and scholars once cornered Lewis and asked him a question. They said, what's the greatest theological discovery you have ever made? And Lewis didn't miss a beat. He smiled and said, I exist to enjoy God's enjoyment of me. Did you hear that? God enjoys you. And God wants you to enjoy him. He wants you to enjoy life. He wants you to enjoy the creation he has made. God enjoys you. I exist to enjoy God's enjoyment of me. You know, Scripture does back God's call of enjoying life. In fact, we read in Romans 15, 13 this. Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul, well, he also says this in 1 Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. For our enjoyment. There it is in Scripture. Now, a long, 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 long time ago, a group of people from the church decided they need to come together and write down and make an account of all the most important beliefs of the faith so everybody could remember them. And they called it catechism. Maybe some of you who grew up in certain traditions know that word, catechism. Well, when they put all these beliefs together, they quickly discovered that it was way too much for people to remember. And so they decided to develop something else called a shorter catechism. And you want to know how that shorter catechism begins? Maybe some of you remember. It begins this way. What is the chief end of humankind to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now let me say it to you in your homes where you're sitting and viewing this worship service. I want you to repeat it after this question. What is the chief end of humankind to glorify God and enjoy him forever? Let me say it again. What is the chief end of humankind to glorify God and enjoy him forever? forever and ever. Now, ironically, I come across many people who really don't want God to be in their life or any kind of religion or faith because they think God is going to make them give up fun. And, you know, and some Christians, miserable Christians, seem how to perpetuate this nonsense where they give off the impression that to become a Christian means the party is over, that to be spiritual means to be miserable. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, to become a Christian means the party is just starting. When you have the love of God in your heart, and when you have the peace of God in your heart, you can't help but be joyful. In fact, the closer we get to God, the more filled with joy we are. That's just the truth. God created us to play and to have joy and to have fun. I believe one of the reasons why many Christians and churches burn out is because they simply lose their joy. That's it. It's nothing more profound than that. Many Christians lose, lose all sense of perspective. Many Christians lose their fire for the Lord. Many churches experience the same because they simply lose their joy. And that's one of the reasons why I'm preaching this message for you. Right now, in the midst of all these heavy issues, I don't want you to lose your joy. And that's what evil wants us to do as the church. Evil wants us to lose hope. Evil wants us to lose our joy. Evil wants us to burn out. So don't do it. Don't lose your joy. Don't lose your sense of God's enjoyment of you. Don't lose your sense of play. Oh, that's critical. In fact, we remember that Jesus reminded us of this. Remember that scene in the Gospels when, when Jesus was, was teaching 
and a bunch of kids just interrupted Jesus completely, and the disciples were appalled. You remember that? You know, they, they got so upset, and the disciples said something like, get these kids out of here. Where are their parents? Don't they know that children ought to be seen and not heard? Get these kids out of here. And do you recall Jesus' response? He was mortified. He was extremely angry, and he said, no, 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 you let them come. You let them interrupt me, because I tell you this, disciples, until you can receive me in the kingdom like one of these precious children, you will never be able to enter it. Now, I always was amazed at that statement from Jesus, honestly, but truthfully, I've understood the deeper meaning of it since I've had a child of my own. Because children are, are open and, and trusting and receptive. They bring nothing but themselves and their joy. And so Jesus was saying, unless you can receive me like a child with joy, unless you can receive the kingdom and the faith with great trust like a child, you'll never be able to understand what it means to live for Almighty God. You know, it's been, it's been said that God is happiest when his children are at play. Oh, I, I believe that. I believe that's true. Because for me, one of the one of the greatest sounds in the world is the sound of my son Paul's laughter. Oh my gosh, those of you who have children of your own, isn't that a great sound? I mean, when Paul giggles, when he really gets laughing, that sound, it goes straight through my heart, right into my soul. So let me ask you this, if I receive that kind of joy from hearing my son Paul laugh, imagine the joy that God receives when all of his children begin to laugh, when all of his children have such joy. Imagine that. I was reminded of this one day when I was playing with Paul at the pool and you were bouncing him up and down in the water and splashing and giggling and, you know, just having a, a wonderful time. And, and I remember being at that pool and it was really crowded and all kinds of kids were playing. And I just closed my eyes and I began to just listen to all the sounds of the children laughing and splashing and playing. And I remember thinking to myself, surely this is the sound of the kingdom. Surely this is the sound of heaven. And tell you, this is one of the great gifts of having a child. It's been one of the great gifts for, for Brandy and I. Because sometimes I can get too serious, and sometimes I can get bogged down in the heaviness of life when Paul shows up and simply says, Daddy, let's go to the playroom. The playroom. Daddy, come on, let's go to the playroom. Let's play puzzles, or let's play cars, or let's, let's do whatever, even this morning. As I was going over this message in my lazy boy and looking over all my notes and making sure I get this all right, Paul comes up to me and, and tugs on my foot and says, Daddy, Daddy, let's play. Let's play cars. And sometimes I believe it's the very word of God to me through Paul when he does that. Paul reminds us not to lose our sense of play, not to lose our sense of joy, and it is a gift. You know, G.K. Chesterton, that great Christian thinker, once said, and, and I love this, he said, God is the last child left in the universe. He said, the rest of us have just simply lost our joy. And the more I think about that quote, the more I think, you know, Chesterton was really onto something. Because when we read through the book of Genesis, honestly, we see that joy radiated through God as he created this world. As God created you and God created me, joy and fun just radiated through God as he did it. And in this vein, Tony Campolo once talked about the time when, he, when his grandson was little and he used to bounce him on his knee. You know, and we often do that, bounce, bounce, ride a little horsey into town, woo! And, you know, 
bring up the child into the air and down again, and he would bounce him, bounce him, and bring him up the child high in the air and down again. And every time he would do it, his grandson would say, do it again, Pop, do it again, do it again. Bounce, 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 say, woo, do it again, Pop, do it again, do it again, do it again. And Campolo profoundly states that something childlike in the heart of God did something like that when God created the world. For example, when when God created that first daisy, God said, oh, do it again, do it again, do it again. And after he created the fourth and the the fifth daisy, God said, oh, do it again, do it again, do it again. And after the, the billionth daisy he created, he said, do it again, do it again, do it again. God is filled with joy and laughter and play and fun. But you know what? Something happened to our world. Something happened to us. We lost our joy. We lost our sense of play. Sin and cynicism crept in, and we simply lost our joy. And so God knew he needed to do something and do something quick. And so what did he do? He came to us in Jesus Christ for us to get our joy back and for our joy to be full. In fact, God would say to us in Christ in John 10.10 these words, I have come that they might have life and have it in all of its abundance. In God, Jesus was showing us how to get our joy back. And at first, honestly, the world didn't know how to respond to this. It was so mired in in pain and, and in sadness and in cynicism and in sin. It didn't know how to respond. In fact, we see an example of this in Luke 7. When Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, you know, the supposed expert in the law, they think they understood and knew everything about God and the faith. And yet Jesus would say to them, some of you remember, he would say to them, I come eating and drinking and having a good time, and yet you accuse me of being a a, a drunkard, a glutton, and a friend to tax collectors and sinners. Basically, they accused Jesus of being a party animal. They just didn't get it. They thought they had God all figured out when they didn't. And Jesus was trying to show them how to get their joy back and for their joy to be full. Do you know what Jesus' first miracle was in the Gospel of John? Very first miracle recorded in the Gospel of John. It It happened at a a small town named Cana at a wedding party. Now back then, a wedding, get this, could last over a week. Imagine getting that bill. So Jesus was invited to this party. So I want you to appreciate this. One of the first scenes in the Gospel of John for Jesus is not him teaching on a mountain somewhere or holding a sick person's hand. It is Jesus at a party. So after a while, the the wine and the wedding party, well, it ran out. And so what did Jesus do, according to Scripture? Did he say, well, it's getting late, it's time to clean up, we've got church tomorrow? No, what did Jesus do? He said, you see all those jars over there that are empty? I want you to fill them with water. And then all of a sudden, he turned them into wine. Now get this. Jesus' first miracle in the Gospel of John was not healing the sick or raising the dead or walking on water. It was basically creating 180 gallons thereabouts of wine so the party could continue. Now, what's the moral of that story? Well, it's not that Jesus is thrilled when we get intoxicated. Don't misunderstand. I believe the meaning of that story is this. God's love for us, and God's joy for us is extravagant. The joy God wants to give to us is extravagant. Now, you can send that story to scholars and theologians and try to find some deeper meaning to it, but you won't find it. The truth of the matter is sometimes Jesus did things for fun, and he was trying for us to get our joy back and for our joy to be full. I think of it this way. When I was a little boy and 
I would get grouchy or grumpy or in a bad mood. My dad had a very clever way of getting me back into a good mood. He wouldn't lecture me. He wouldn't say, don't complain, be grateful for what you have. You know what he'd do? He'd kind of playfully wrestle me to the floor, and he'd find a spot just above my belly button, and he would blow air bubbles on it so much that it would tickle, and so much that I would just have to give in to laughter. You know, quite simply, on a very existential, spiritual level, and physical level, that's what God did for us. He got down on our level in Christ to embrace us and for us to get our joy back. So you have homework to do, okay? You have homework. I'm giving you homework. Go out and let yourself be loved. Go out and find joy. Go go hack at a golf ball. Go listen to your favorite music and sing and dance like no one is watching or listening. Go and watch your favorite comedy. That's what I did the other day. I said, you know what? I need to watch Caddyshack again for the 83rd time. I mean, you can always laugh at Caddyshack. Go and laugh. Go and find your joy. Don't get so mired in taking yourself so seriously that you lose the joy God wants to give to all of his children. I came across a a great quote some time ago by Nadine Stair, an 85-year-old woman from the hill country of Kentucky. She said this. I love it. She said, if I had to live my life over again, I would dare to make more mistakes next time. I would relax. I would be sillier. I wouldn't take myself so seriously. I've been one of those persons who never went any place without a thermometer, a hot water bottle, and a raincoat, and a parachute. If I had to do it over again, she said, I'd travel lighter. How would you finish this sentence? If I had to do it over again, I would. Why not do it now? Find your joy. Find God's enjoyment of you. Don't lose your joy. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, yes, guide us and help us with your wisdom to to navigate and confront and deal with the issues at hand in this society. But Lord, as we do it, prevent us from losing our joy and our sense of play and our sense of pleasure in you. Oh, Lord, it so often happens when we take ourselves so seriously that we lose the very spirit of joy and love that flows so easily by your spirit. Oh, help us to get back in touch with that. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song. And so I invite you at this time to just gather with those you're watching this service with and sing this closing hymn together.